What's going on with the A's and the Marlins and the rest of baseball? We'll dive in later with former Marlins president David Sampson. Plus, the Rays are trying to strike a major stadium deal. The Indiana Fever will be broadcast on many networks. And we have our contenders for the Utah hockey team name. It's Friday, May 10th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. Tampa Bay Rays have designs on a new $1.3 billion stadium, which would comprise 20% of a proposed $6.5 billion development surrounding the ballpark. St. Petersburg Mayor Ken Welch did not hold back in describing the project, saying, This isn't just a stadium. This is a stadium surrounded by the largest development in the state of Florida, if not the nation. Business leaders are also supporting the project, which would include 1,500 residential units, some of which would be classified as affordable housing, a Black History Museum, a hotel and office retail and medical space. And the Rays want to break ground in the spring of 2025 and open the 30,000 seat stadium in 2028. All they need is a deal, and they don't have that yet. The team is asking for more than $700 million in public funding, with St. Petersburg spending $418 million and Pinellas County chipping in $313 million. Not everyone loves that arrangement. A group called No Home Run would like the Rays to pay rent, split revenue with the city and county, and to buy the land they are using at something closer to market rate. Which side to take is now largely in the hands of the St. Petersburg City Council. Caitlin Clark rewrote the record books. Now she's rewriting broadcasting contracts. The Indiana Fever will be broadcast in 12 television markets across five states. In addition to the Indianapolis station, WTHR, the fever will be on 11 additional stations covering Indiana, Illinois, Ohio, Iowa, and Kentucky. Those deals, however, will only cover 17 of the fever's 36 regular season games. Worry not, though, because all fever games will be on national television in some form. ABC, ESPN, ESPN2, ESPN+, Disney+, Prime Video, CBS, CBS Sports Network, ION, and NBA TV will each get some piece of the action, with some games appearing on multiple networks. Clark is obviously an incredible player, but if she can simply meet the hype that is at a fever pitch before her first WNBA game, that by itself would be an amazing achievement. We now have our 20 finalists for the name of the Utah hockey team. The team solicited name ideas from fans, and there will be votes to narrow it down. Let's take a look. The names break into several categories. I'll give you the categories and then the names from best to worst, according to me. We'll start with skiing and snow names. Those are Black Diamonds, Squall, Blizzard, and Powder. I'm giving Squall points for a weirdness. Powder is not a great name for a hockey team, but it would be hilarious to name a team after a fine dust. There are a few other wintry names, which we'll put in a separate category. Those are Yeti, Caribou, Mammoth, Blast, Glaciers, Freeze, Frost, and Ice. I'll say it again, Yeti is excellent. It's got mythology, true believers, it fits the area, excellent mascot possibilities. It should be the number one overall seed. Caribou is also excellent for many of the same reasons. Mammoth is good too, but they should have gone with Woolly Mammoth. I like Glaciers, except it's really setting yourself up for insult anytime a player does something too slowly. Ice would be like naming a baseball team the grass or a basketball team the wooden floor. There are three we'll group together as Western-themed. Those are the Canyons, Mountaineers, and Outlaws. Outlaws is just not a great idea, but it would be funny for a team to leave Arizona and then name itself the Canyons. There are two bee-related names because Utah is the beehive state, not because of anything related to actual bees, but because bees are considered industrious. Those are the Hive and the Swarm. Both have potential. Lastly, there is the Fury, Venom, and HC. To all of those, I say, meh. At some point, people will be able to vote on those names, and it's incumbent on all of us to try to get this right. Joined now, once again, by the host of Nothing Personal with David Sampson, David Sampson. Welcome, David. How's it going? I am doing well. Lots on the agenda today. Lots lots to talk about. Let's start with your old friends, the Marlins. Um, so they've had some injuries, some underperformance, and they effectively waved the white flag a quarter of the way into the season by trading Luis Arias from a baseball perspective, I get it. He's an impending free agent. Like um, President of Baseball Ops Peter Bendix said, they're probably not making the playoffs. Uh, still, that's got a sting for the fans and if you're on the business side of things. So what's your take here? Well, Owen, he actually has one more year after this before free agency. Oh, does he? So, okay. So that is at least my understanding. Therefore, you're going to get as much as possible for him the earlier you trade him. And it's interesting to understand your team understand what happened last year with your team, which is they made the playoffs, which 
They had a hugely amazing record in one run games. Everything yeah. seemed to come together. They were the best of the mediocre. They were gone quickly, but they made the playoffs. And that's all you can ask for. But when they looked at their numbers and their PL, they knew they couldn't bring in any free agents. And I'm not counting Tim Anderson. So they didn't do anything to improve their team. And that's because they couldn't. They knew they had Sandy and he was going to be out for the year with Tommy John. Injuries are going to happen. You don't have the depth. It wasn't the time to quote unquote, go all in, which I did as a small revenue team way too many times. And it's not that smart to do, but that said the Marlins didn't do it. Then when they got off to a slow start, it was like their dream come true because it gave them the ability to make trades that they should be making anyway, but are super hard to make if you're in a playoff race. Yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, it's sort of a blessing in disguise if, if you know, something works out. But, uh, but yeah. I mean, who's going to say that the Marlins, that with the Raya's, that they were going to be a playoff contender this year? They weren't. And they're not going to sign him to a free agent deal when he becomes a free agent. They weren't going to extend him. Don't forget that they've got Stanton on the payroll starting in 2026 for three straight years. So he becomes a $10 million player on that team for three straight years. So as you're planning your one, three, and five-year payroll, you're making decisions based on both short and long-term. Obviously, he came off a little clumsy because Peter Bendix comes off as clumsy because his job is not to be an orator. His job is to try to make a franchise. And, uh, you know, the Marlins had to make the deal. I don't know why they paid his salary. I would not have allowed that as president of the team. The reason, let me tell you, if you don't mind how this works, when you do a trade, you speak to the other team's GM and you're talking about players and then you're talking about money. The money is how much of this player's contract will you be paying? That's what the acquiring team asks. And the Marlins could have said zero. You have to take on the money. The Padres would have then said, well, then we can't talk about a rise because we don't have capacity to take on payroll. And so the Marlins could have gone to another team, Royals. I'm not sure they would have taken it on. But you go down the list and see who will take on all the money. Then you go who will take on half the money. You keep going down to see what it's going to take to move a player. What teams tell you is they do it because they get better players. The Marlins got better players because they paid a rise this contract. That is total horse hockey. You can go find a trade. These are prospects. Go back and look over trades where teams are paying money down to get, quote unquote, the better prospect. And then it's the throw in that ends up being the better player of the deal. You just don't know. These are young kids they traded for. To me, I would have insisted that the Marlins save the payroll. Interesting. All right, let's hop over to our old friends, the Oakland A's. Uh, so John Fisher still out there looking for investment money. Uh, wh what's taken him so long? <laughs> Well, it's very hard to find people to invest as a limited partner in a franchise when you're trying to do it at a valuation that is based on the come. And everything about the A's valuation as a franchise is based on what's going to be, not what is or what has been. And what's going to be in John's mind when he's pitching to a document, when he's pitching a valuation to investors, He's saying, we're going to have a new ballpark. We're going to be in a healthier situation. We're going to have a competitive team. We're going to get 2 million people. The TV situation is going to iron itself out. And everything's going to be butterflies and rainbows and unicorns. So therefore, buy 10% of the team and give me $200 million. And people are saying, well, that math doesn't work. This is not a $2 billion team. It's not even a $1 billion team right now. There's so much uncertainty. So I think there's a real disconnect between what investors are valuing his team at and what he's valuing his team at. Right, because if he wants $500 million and that's the reporting, yeah, that sounds like you know close to half the team and he's got to keep 51% to continue being owner of the Oakland A's. And so, yeah, not an easy spot for him. So he can actually go below 51 if he wants and still be the general partner. As long as he owns the most percentage of any of the other partners, he could still be the control owner and the general partner. But really what you're saying is 
could he raise the 500 million now? And the answer is, of course, value the team at 600 million and sell, you know, 90% of it. I could get a deal done for you tomorrow. But that is not what John's trying to do. And that's the delay. It's really just a negotiation. Uh, though I would also argue that if you're John Fisher, you're looking at the deal in Vegas, you're thinking about everything that could happen with that ballpark situation. And you're saying, I don't want to sell shares until I know that I need this money to start construction for a stadium. And where I sit, I don't believe that he knows that yet. Yeah, interesting. And recently, as you saw, uh, Bally's chair, so Bally's, as to remind our listeners, is giving the A's a nine acres of land on the Tropicana site. And so they've been in talks with the A's for a while. Their chairman, Sue Kim, said on a podcast that really it's it was MLB trying to keep them in Oakland. The A's were, you know, looking for reasons to uh, to leave and, you know, were, were happy to to get the thumbs up from Manfred when they finally got it. But it was MLB trying to, to pull them back, which makes a lot of sense because MLB, well, you know, they like the Oakland market theoretically, and they uh, and they want more spots for relocation and more spots for expansion. So, yeah, so for them, they, of course, Rob Manford was honest when he's been telling you the whole time, we don't want teams to move. It's not good for our league to have teams relocating. They did it with the Expos to Washington way back, I guess that was 2005, so it's almost 20 years ago, and they just don't want that. But at the same time, Sue Kim, to me, if you listen to that podcast, I, I have zero confidence in the redevelopment of the 36 acres at the Tropicana site. I have zero confidence in the direction of Bally's given the way he talked and the things he said. Totally delusional about what a stadium in Vegas means and how many people will be there. It really is funny to me that anyone believes the projections that that number of tourists will go to 81 games in Vegas. Because on one hand, he's saying everybody's going to come. But on the other end, he says, isn't it great that baseball happens during the time when Vegas is, quote unquote, quiet or dead. So I took issue with myriad of his points. And uh, I, I guess we'll see what's going to happen. But after that podcast, I certainly did not get the feeling that everything was good. And then on top of that, he mentioned, oh, we're not exactly sure where in the 36 acres the ballpark's right. going to go. <laughs> How do they I, not know yet? Oh, my God. Oh, and I almost died. <laughs> You can't design a building and just plop it down wherever you feel. It doesn't work that way. You design a building when you know exactly where it's going because part of the design of the building is the underbelly, the piping, the utilities, all the things that fans don't see that are required when building a ballpark. So for example, imagine if it's put on part of the site and instead of that great view through the left field window, what if you're looking right at a casino wall? It's preposterous that they don't have a fully developed site plan. It's preposterous that they don't know which of the nine acres they're going to use. And it's triply preposterous to think that any agreements can actually be done. Relocation agreements, construction agreements, financing agreements without knowing even that base level issue, like where the hell is this building going to be? Yeah, I mean, so little of it feels not quite real. I mean, they, they've got their site, they've got a plan, they've got some state money. But, you know, we've heard the A's saying, like, oh, we didn't release our renderings for a while because we wanted to put the Tropicana in the renderings. And then Valley said, well, we've been waiting to see where the, the build, where the stadium goes before we put the Tropicana there. And then, you know, there's concerns about traffic that, like, matter based on where the building is and where it's positioned. And, uh, it's a three <laughs> yeah, like, all this is stuff. what it is. Yeah, it's nuts. How much does it matter if um, Bally's, I mean, has its its own issues, you know, separate from all this? They're, they're way in debt. They've got they're trying to build a big casino in Chicago, which is its own thing. Um, if they're in real financial trouble, how much does that matter to the A's? Well, listen, it's funny you say that the A's had a deal in Oakland that they could have worked on and massaged and figured out where they would have had the ancillary development that all owners crave around new ballparks. Now in Vegas, they're doing a deal where they won't control any of the ancillary development. They won't profit from any of the ancillary development the way they do in Atlanta, let's say. 
and they won't they won't even have a say of the timeline. But the chairman of Bally's comes out and says, "We're in no rush." That's code word for we don't have the money, but we're in no rush to develop. Can you imagine if the ballpark opens? I did that. We opened without any development around, and it's a terrible plan. But in the absence of any other choice, you do that. But it's a last choice. And the thing about relocation is that's supposed to be a first choice for a franchise. It's supposed to help the franchise. For example, if I could take a second, when the Expos moved to Washington, there was no development around Nationals Park at all. But being in Washington from day one was a better economic situation than being in Montreal. Day one, there is no proof of any kind that being in Vegas will be better than Oakland on day one. Yeah, absolutely. Because first of all, people love the A's here. And it's like, I, I see I'm, I'm in the area. I see A's hats everywhere I go. Um, you know, maybe less so these days, but, um, but uh, yeah. And will people of Vegas fall in love with the A's like uh, TBD, I guess. Um, speaking of relocation, expansion, new stadiums, um, and the, there could be a referendum on, on the public money going to the A's. And if there is, I will be shocked if it, if, uh, if they keep that money. Uh, but it feels like any referendum right now is death. Rule number one, Owen. Rule number one, when you're putting a stadium deal together, no referendums. We don't want to hear from the people because they're going to tell us what we don't want to hear. And there's an old story in the law or in relationships. If you don't like the answer you're about to get, then don't ask the question. Yeah, right. And it feels like, I mean, maybe there's always been this lingering sentiment here, but also it feels like more prominent now, like now maybe the public didn't like it, but the politician would say like, yeah, but we still still here. And so they would, it feels like now we're getting pushed back, like say from governor Pritzker in Illinois, um, the, um, the commanders were blocked in Maryland, um, or Virginia, sorry, now I'm mixing them up, but I, it feels there, there's real resistance that is, seems to be blocking deals in a way there wasn't before. Yeah. The wizards had that issue where they announced a deal. The Tampa Bay Rays announced a deal. When did they do that? They did a whole press conference with the whole deal with St. Petersburg, except there wasn't a deal with St. Petersburg. Other than that, I, owners love, and I'm guilty. I loved it too. We did a press conference in Montreal. Everybody loves a good press conference with renderings but they really aren't worth the paper they're printed on or the minutes that people spend watching them. And what you're seeing now is a reflection of where people feel they are economically, of the difference between the haves and the have nots, the fact that the middle class has been so squozen and you've got what people perceive as billionaires getting corporate handouts and it's impacting, are, they're not paying taxes in the US and all of these things that people hear it makes them say, hey, sports owners, we don't want you to get anything. Build a ballpark for yourself with your own money. The problem is a baseball team, a basketball team, a football team, that is a community asset. Of course, it accrues to the benefit of the owner from a P&L standpoint and from an asset appreciation standpoint. But at the same time, it's not going to go away, these public subsidies, because people in government understand that in order to have a complete community, you need science museums and you need cultural art centers and you need art museums, you need public parks, you need infrastructure, you need sports. All of those things add up to make a community and that's a government's job to make a community livable, to make people wanna do business there and to do life there. So while there's a lot more talk about it, Owen, it's not going away. Right. Well, also the threat of relocation isn't going away, right? Teams, there's always going to be some place out there that say, oh, yeah, well, we might give you some money. And so say the Arizona Diamondbacks and say like, hey, hey, Phoenix, hey, Arizona, are you going to give us, you know, 300, 400 million dollars? Because if not, like Utah would take us, anyone, any number of places would take us and they're willing to pay up because for them, they're, they're buying something. There's no question. One of my favorite things from this past few months, and there's been so much sports business activity was the Diamondback statement after the Coyotes left for Utah. They released a statement about the hockey team leaving, basically chastising the government for allowing it to happen, saying, how could you do this? Meanwhile, what they were really saying is, don't make us leave. 
you better pay up exactly what we want to renovate or construct a new ballpark in Phoenix because we're not staying at Chase Field in this old stadium for too much longer. So uh, everybody's got an agenda. I love you, Derek Hall. Of course you have an agenda, and that, and you should. That's why you're good at your job. But uh, the positioning, the relocation, the threats, it's been going on since before half your audience was born. Tampa Bay used to be Vegas. Everyone was threatening to move to Tampa Bay. The White Sox, the Giants. Yeah, people are always White Sox might threaten move. it again. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, it's funny. Jerry Reinsdorf could have a senior moment and threaten to move the team to Tampa again. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's already trying to, like, sort of make those threats of, like, I'll tell my heirs to move the team if you don't give me I a stadium. I can't control like... what my heirs do once they <laughs> yeah. sell the team. But if there's a new ballpark, then they have no say. The team has to be here for 30, 40 years. I give, I tipped my chapeau to Jerry with that one. I never heard that one. Don't let me die without a new publicly funded ballpark. Chef's kiss for that one. All right, we'll leave it at that. David Sampson, thank you so much for joining us. All right, take care. That's it for today. Share this podcast with a friend you think would enjoy it and then get outside, enjoy the warm weather. Have a great weekend. We'll see you on Monday.